Hello, welcome. Uh, my name is Jan Kaminski. I'm a colorectal surgeon at Illinois Masonic Medical Center. And I want to welcome you to our uh, inflammatory bowel disease panel discussion. For COVID precautions, um, all of our panelists have been vaccinated and we've taken all the appropriate precautions for um, COVID-19. Uh, and that's why uh, we, uh, all of our panels don't have masks. Um, inflammatory bowel disease is a significant problem in the U.S. Um, 1.6 million um, uh, patients currently have Crohn's disease and another 70,000 new cases a year will be diagnosed this year. Um, we have a significant opportunity for Advocate Aurora system to evaluate, manage, and treat our inflammatory bowel disease patients in a multidisciplinary fashion and to make it more efficient and to um, consolidate care. Um, I'm very pleased and honored and humbled to present our panel. These are our specialists who specifically deal with inflammatory bowel disease. The goal of this um, panel discussion is to kind of provide information on, our, on evaluation, management, and treatment of inflammatory bowel disease and we'll have direct answers and direct questions to the specialists who deal with this every single day. And another disclosure, uh, there's no relevant financial disclosures uh, for myself or all the panelists. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce the panel, and I'd actually like them to introduce themselves, and we'll start off with Dr. Albert. Hello, my name is Dr. Andrew Albert. I am a practicing gastroenterologist and also Medical Director of Digestive Health here at Advocate Illinois Masonic Medical Center. And Dr. Estrada? Hi, my name is Joaquin Estrada. I'm a colorectal surgeon here at Advocate Aurora. I have a practice in, at Illinois Masonic Hospital and also at Good Samaritan Hospital. I'm also the Surgical Director of Digestive Health at Illinois Masonic Hospital. Dr. Pant? Hi, I'm Mamta Pant. I'm one of the five staff pathologists at Illinois Masonic and I am GI Pathology Fellowship trained. Bailey Hanselman. Hi, my name is Bailey Hanselman, and I'm the Nurse Navigator for Digestive Health here at Illinois Masonic. And last and certainly not least, Dr. Basque. Hi, I'm Kyle Basque. I'm one of the radiologists practicing here at Illinois Masonic Medical Center. Um, one of my main focuses and practices is GI imaging. Thank you very much. So I do want to start off with um, kind of the beginning and the end of inflammatory bowel disease is pathology. So I'd like to ask Dr. Pont to give us kind of a brief synopsis and overview and diagnosis of what is inflammatory bowel disease. Inflammatory bowel disease comprising of ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease is a chronic intestinal inflammatory disorder of unknown etiology. What distinguishes IBD from inflammatory response seen in normal gut is its inability to downregulate these responses. So in such individuals, the mucosal immune system remains chronically activated and the intestine remains chronically inflamed. If we look at the pathophysiology, IBD is precipitated by a complex interaction of genes, environmental factors, and immunomodulatory factors. For the genetic component, we all know that the risk of IBD is relatively high in certain race and ethnicity, for instance, Ashkenazi Jews and Caucasians. And the risk is relatively high in first-degree relatives of IBD patients compared to general population. So genes definitely play a role. Interestingly, genome-wide association studies have identified more than 200 genetic susceptibility loci associated with IBD. Some are specific for Crohn's disease versus ulcerative colitis, and that can explain the difference in the clinical, endoscopic, and histologic findings in these patients. And some of these loci are shared that indicates that both the diseases follow the same chronic inflammatory pathway. So at least based on these studies, we know that uh, both ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease are genetically complex, and the pathophysiology cannot be explained by a single gene model. 
And these genes confer disease specificity and phenotype, and heritable component is stronger for Crohn's disease compared to ulcerative colitis. But there are other factors other than genes that play an equally important role. So if you think about geographically, IBD is common in uh, northern climates like North European or uh, North America, developed or what you call industrialized nations and urban population. But newer ep epidemiological studies have shown that the risk of IBD is rising in developing countries. So this change in epidemiological patterns suggests that environmental factors do play a role. And some of them are smoking, diet, medications, and microbiota. So if you think about smoking, we all know that IBD is, uh, sorry, uh, smoking is harmful in uh, Crohn's disease and protective and ulcerative colitis. So the mechanisms hypothesized to explain its role is direct toxicity to <coughs> immune cells or the mucous cells or change in microbiome or uh, impairment of autophagy, which is intracellular self-cannibalism. Diet rich in processed meat or saturated fatty acids increase the risk of IBD. Conversely, high fiber diet is protective. And one of the possible explanation is dietary fibers are metabolized by uh, colonic bacteria into short chain fatty acids, which have anti-inflammatory property. Then med medications, uh, notably antibiotics, have been associated with increased risk of IBD, and the possible explanation is change in microbiome. So this brings up to the next question is, what is intestinal microbiome? So our gastrointestinal tract has the largest number and greatest diversity of bacteria. If there is an imbalance in the proportion of uh, protective and harmful bacteria, uh, this is known as mi uh, microbial dysbiosis, and this is suggested to be one of the vital pathways uh, in the pathogenesis of IBD. So whether this is a cause or a consequence of IBD is yet to be determined. So if there is increase in bacteria with pro-inflammatory capacities and decrease in bacteria with anti-inflammatory capacities, this decreases the concentration of short-chain fatty acids, which provide nourishment to colonocytes. So this will uh, impair the growth and differentiation of epithelial cells. It will uh, disrupt the intestinal barrier and lead to mucosal inflammation. So then the question is, what is intestinal barrier? So if you look at the image on the left-hand side, it is from the normal bowel. So normally the intestinal mucosa maintains a functional equilibrium with the luminal contents. And any disruption in this equilibrium leads to diseases like IBD. In fact, it has been suggested that this is the primary defect in IBD. So the intestinal barrier is formed by the intestinal epithelial cells as well as the immune cells. So we all know that intestinal epithelial cells include enterocytes, goblet cells, panet cells, neuroendocrine cells, and M cells. Goblet cells, for example, secrete mucus layer that reduces the exposure of intestinal epithelial cells to microbiota. And the panet cells secrete antimicrobial peptides. So basically in healthy state, uh, the mucosal immune system uh, has an anti, maintains an anti-inflammatory environment. In IBD, there is dis the microbial dysbiosis lead to disruption of intestinal barrier, which increases intestinal permeability and increases bacterial exposure. This will activate the innate immune system and lead to imbalance in the pro-inflammatory, anti-inflammatory signals. This will finally result in release of inflammatory cytokines and uh, leukocyte activation that will transmigrate to the inflamed epithelium. And finally, an exaggerated T cell response. And the T cells involved in this immune response seem to be different in both Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. So in summary, the pathophysiology of inflammatory bowel disease involves a complex interplay of genes, environmental factors, epithelial factors, microbial factors, and immune factors. The newer immunotherapies, either in clinical trial or in development, 
uh, aim to reduce mucosal inflammation by blocking these downstream signaling pathways that are associated with near, um, associated with cytokines. Thank you uh, for that uh, wonderful uh, summary of pathophysiology of inflammatory bowel disease. Um, it is a complicated um, disease. Some people say it may be more complicated than cancer, uh, but that's uh, uh, a topic for a different day. Um, Dr. Albert, what are the signs and symptoms of IBD? What should our audience be concerned about and what are the most common signs and symptoms, and what are red flag symptoms? So just the key differentiator, inflammatory bowel disease and irritable bowel syndrome are two totally different entities. Inflammatory bowel disease, as Dr. Pond was explaining, is an inflammatory cascade of events. So ultimately what happens in inflammatory bowel disease is that the inflammation causes swelling, redness, potentially bleeding, ulceration of various parts of the GI tract, leading to ulceration, pain, discomfort. I will say that in some cases of inflammatory bowel disease, as bad as the inflammatory process can be, a patient may have no symptoms whatsoever and potentially could have just an anemia or an inflammatory marker like a sed rate or CRP that's elevated. Uh, in terms of worry, worry signs or concerning signs of inflammatory bowel disease, some of the highlights beyond the cramping, the bloating, the altered bowel habits, uh, which also could be irritable bowel, some of the mo more uh, concerning symptoms would include weight loss, change in appetite, uh, feeling weak and tired related to anemia. Um, some patients have uh, bowel obstructive uh, symptoms, uh, some patients, uh, like I said, feel well. But the warning signs should always be investigated in any GI disease or GI process. Weight loss, change in appetite uh, are, are key differentiators uh, in, in a chronic advanced process. Of course, rectal bleeding should definitely be mentioned. Rectal bleeding and also frequency. One thing uh, that should also be noted is that nocturnal stooling is, in my mind, a key differentiator between irritable bowel and inflammatory bowel. If there's nocturnal stooling where patients are getting up to have a bowel movement, not to urinate, but to have a bowel movement, that's more concerning to me than, than some of the other milder symptoms like cramping and bloating. So to answer your question, weight loss, change in appetite, rectal bleeding, those are all very concerning symptoms associated with inflammatory, again, I'll say it again, inflammatory bowel disease. Right, so that's actually a great point, Dr. Albert. Inflammatory bowel disease, or IBD, is different than irritable bowel syndrome, or IBS. So that was a great kind of uh, introduction to the differences. Dr. Estrada, how can we determine if a patient has IBD or IBS? So IBS is... is and IBD often uh, confused because they have similar similar letters and names, so patients often get confused themselves, right? So many patients will say, I have IBD, when they indeed just have IBS. IBD, inflammatory bowel disease, as already been described. IBS, though, is more of a symptomatology. Maybe they have uh, irritability to their intestines. Maybe they have diarrhea or constipation. I think when we try to differentiate the, the two uh, disease processes, it's important to ask the patient uh, what they're experiencing. Try to get a very thorough history. Patients that have uh, inflammatory bowel disease that encompasses both ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease typically have other manifestations beyond changes in their bowel habits. They might have weight loss. They might have anemia. They might have um, external findings on physical examination. They may have a chronic uh, history of this. They may have a family history of Crohn's disease or colitis. Many patients with irritable bowel syndrome might have a sensitivity to things that they eat. Now, the problem is that there's overlap. There's overlap between the two, the two conditions, and so that's there in two lies the confusion. Not only do they sound similar, but there's also an overlap of symptoms as well. And so usually there's a, there's a group of tests that need to be done, whether those are inflammatory markers that are done by blood draws, but the gold standard truly is a colonoscopy. A colonoscopy with biopsy will be able to determine if there's any microscopic inflammation that was previously described by Dr. Pont. 
If there is microscopic inflammation, that is in, argues in favor of colitis or, uh, or Crohn's disease. Without that and the constellation of symptoms, um, that tends to favor more irritable bowel syndrome. So again, irritable bowel syndrome, they may have similar findings, but without this, the obvious signs of inflammation seen on colonoscopy. Whereas inflammatory bowel disease will have not only these similar symptoms, but they will also have system, may have systemic markers and um, microscopic evidence of inflammation as well. Many of these, many of these tests are done uh, with uh, a gastroenterologist. Uh, or, so somebody like Dr. Albert might order these tests. Uh, and it's usually much further down the line where I get involved. So, Dr. Uh, Pond, um, a lot of times uh, for colon cancer, for instance, we get a biopsy and a lot of times we can say, yes, this is cancer. Is that role for pathology the same for inflammatory bowel disease? Can we 100% say that you have inflammatory bowel disease on a biopsy uh, from your standpoint? So the way I would approach this question is, if the patient has features of IBD, both clinically and endoscopically, and the biopsy shows classic chronic active colitis pattern of injury, then the findings favor IBD or inflammatory bowel disease. The difficulty arises when the features of chronic mucosal injury or chronicity are very subtle, and that can be seen in earlier evolving inflammatory bowel disease. In such scenarios, we can, always, we can give a differential. We cannot exclude IBD, but at the same time, we cannot commit on the diagnosis of IBD. So this raises a question whether chronic active colitis pattern of injury is uh, equivalent to IBD, and the answer is no. In, uh, IBD biopsies show features of chronicity at some point in the disease course, but not all chronicity equate to IBD. There are a lot of other conditions can, that it can have features of chronic mucosal injury and biopsy, which we call IBD mimics. So those need to be excluded. So basically, the diagnosis of IBD relies on integrated evaluation of clinical, endoscopic, radiologic, and pathologic findings. Dr. Bosk, speaking of radiological findings, what radiological findings do we see in inflammatory bowel disease? That's A. And then B, is there a difference between inflammatory bowel disease and IBS on radiology? So to answer your, the second question first, the findings in IBS and radiology are essentially, by definition, no findings. Because it's a functional disease and not a structural or organic disease, um, generally, there are no specific findings or no findings that are described as being classically related to IBS. Um, typically, when we get imaging for um, IBS, we're not really making the diagnosis of IBS. We're ruling out other things that could be going on that could be red flag, syndrome, uh, red flag syndromes for something else. Um, so, yeah, so by, almost by definition, IBS has no radiologic findings. Um, IBD, on the other hand, um, so we have ulcerative colitis and Crohn's, and basically those two diseases have pretty distinct uh, appearances on imaging. So with regards to the imaging of IBD um, in radiology, the two subtypes, Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis, they're going to differ in the areas that are involved, and that's the easiest um, distinction between those two. So with ulcerative colitis, it's classically um, rectal inflammation that's then contiguous with more proximal colon inflammation, whereas with um, Crohn's disease, it's classically skip lesions with um, a pre predilection to the terminal ileum, but also to other parts of the small and large bowel. So um, bowel wall thickening in radiology is not a specific finding, but when you have bowel wall thickening in the suspicious areas for IBD in a patient who has a clinical history compatible with that, um, it can really be strong supporting evidence of the diagnosis. Um, Dr. Albert, um, as far as I understand, inflammatory bowel disease is on a spectrum with, uh, just like Dr. Bosk was saying, Crohn's disease on one end, ulcerative colitis on the other. 
and a lot of other variations in between. Can you elaborate uh, for us what that means? Sure. So let me just take a step back and just clearly define the entities. So Crohn's disease is an inflammatory disorder of mucosal involvement from the mouth to the anus. So you could have Crohn's involving the mouth with canker sores or, or small ulcers, aphthous ulcers. You could have Crohn's disease of the stomach, the small intestine, the large intestine, the anal area. Sometimes you could have perianal disease from Crohn's and have no inflammation anywhere else. With ulcerative colitis, that is within the term colitis, which means it's only in the colon. And so if you were to technically remove the colon, which we'll get to later, I'm sure, that would be curative for ulcerative colitis because ulcerative colitis is just an ulcerating colon. That's it. Now, there's different levels of inflammation. I'm sure Dr. Pond can weigh in, but in my experience as a gastroenterologist, there's mild, moderate, and severe disease. There's mild, moderate Crohn's, and there's mild, mild moderate, and severe Crohn's, and mild, moderate, and severe ulcerative colitis. Um, sometimes, in fairness, um, <laughs> there are exceptions. Not everything is perfect. Sometimes ulcerative colitis can make its way a little bit into the small intestine. So there are variations. But in terms of answering your question, there are differences in severity um, in both entities, both Crohn's from mouth to anus and ulcerative colitis only in the colon. Dr. Um, Estrada, for, uh, for the spectrum of uh, inflammatory bowel disease, uh, what do you tell your patients when you first see them um, in terms of um, diagnosis and in terms of management from a surgical standpoint for both ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease? So when I, when I meet a patient with a new diagnosis of inflammatory bowel disease, I reinforce to them that this is a condition that there are many options. And usually surgery is one of the options that we consider at the end of the road. So you have to kind of think of ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease separately because they're, they're treated slightly differently. For ulcerative colitis, um, many of our patients will uh, undergo some type of immune modulation, and that's in, in conjunction with our gastroenterologist. So there's a lot, a lot of different medications that can uh, help blunt the inflammatory process within the colon, whether those are pills, whether those are uh, local therapy, or some, some version of an injectable medication. And over the years, that's been shown to be very effective at blunting that response and even re reversing some of the uh, chronic inflammation that's been going on. For patients that are refractory to those medications, that's when we start to consider surgery. Um, and for ulcerative colitis, surgery can offer a cure. It can offer a cure off of medications. So for many patients that are completely uh, depleted and beaten down from this, from this chronic inflammation over the years, undergoing surgery is life-changing. And for those patients, they have dramatic responses. But that's not true of everybody. Not everybody that has inflammatory bowel disease is going to have such a robust response to surgery. For instance, Crohn's disease, as Dr. Albert said, can affect the entire GI tract from the mouth to the anus and anywhere in between, and in multiple areas too, oftentimes in skip lesions, as we might say. So they could be in two or three different areas. Surgery is far less effective at managing that disease. And really, surgery is reserved for the complications, whether that's a bleeding ulcer that's, that cannot be addressed through other measures, whether that's uh, malignancy from the chronic inflammation, or whether that's an obstruction. That's when the surgeon gets involved. But the key to anybody that's being diagnosed with inflammatory bowel disease is having a discussion with your team of doctors, uh, whether that's your, your, um, <coughs> with your primary care doctor, your gastroenterologist, your colorectal surgeon. Your um, entire team will help weigh in and develop a, a plan for you that makes the most sense for you as the patient and makes most sense for the condition that you're being uh, diagnosed with. So speaking of our multidisciplinary team that is involved with treating inflammatory bowel disease, I'd like to ask a question to Bailey, who's our care coordinator specialist. What's your role when you first meet a patient uh, who has been diagnosed with IBD? And um, how do you kind of maneuver uh, this patient through a complex system like we have in the United States? Thank you, that's a great question. 
Um, I really see my role working with any patient, whether they've just been diagnosed, whether they've been um, navigating having inflammatory bowel disease for many years, is just to really meet that patient where they're at. What do they need in that moment from me and how can I advocate for them? And then also how can I work with them so that they can uh, become a self-advocate and advocate for themselves? Um, and so often that starts with figuring out, you know, where they're at with their diagnosis, which specialists have they seen, um, have they are, are, do they already have a gastroenterologist, do they need to see a surgeon, and um, most importantly, do they have a primary care provider, because that person can really act as a sounding board um, and a home base for this patient that is navigating many different specialists and many different care systems. Great, thank you. So we kind of talked about um, how to diagnose inflammatory bowel disease and how to distinguish between ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease. Um, it's uh, challenging, to say the least, because we need to look at clinical findings, endoscopic findings, pathology, and then meld them all together. So uh, once we do diagnose, um, like Dr. Estrada was saying, medical management is probably the first step. Dr. Albert, what's the difference between a top-to-bottom approach versus a bottom-to-top approach? And can you elaborate that for us? Sure. Uh, so what Dr. Kaminsky is referring to is um, using, using the strongest medication first or using sort of stepping up the therapy. So typically with medication, what we do is we start with a mesalamine derivative, which is a topical medication that coats the colon or the small intestine, decreasing local inflammation. That's usually used in milder cases. Um, but then when you get to moderate disease, then you're getting into um, using prednisone or some steroid derivative and sort of stepping up to the top, if you will. Um, and then once you, once you have used your steroids, unfortunately, you can't keep patients on steroids indefinitely because of all the toxic side effects of steroids, including osteoporosis, hip fractures, and, and such. Uh, then ultimately, you use immunomodulation with uh, something called Imuran or 6MP, and then ultimately uh, reaching to the, the highest level, which is like a biologic therapy, uh, which basically also is an immune modulator type of therapy, uh, but stronger. Um, the therapy needs to be tailored to each patient. Patients will switch between multiple therapies depending on how quickly you can get them from active disease to remission. Um, it's a really hard task to know where to enter the, the medication continuum, if you will, because patients respond differently. Some patients with severe disease will start at the, the lowest level of using mesalamine. Some patients with mild disease will require biologic therapy like adalimumab um, or Simzia. Um, so it really, the therapies vary. It's not a one, one size fits all kind of thing. It really depends on how the patient responds to your initial treatment and then you scale up therapy accordingly. But to Dr. Kaminsky's question, some people start off with the most aggressive of therapies. Some people start off with the most mild of therapies, giving patients a chance. I think, again, the therapies will change. And for the providers out there, if you're wondering why in severe disease we use one versus the other, it really depends on the clinician. It depends on how the patient responds. It depends on all the factors, whether it's radiology, blood work, biopsy. All those factors come in and require a multidisciplinary input. So if radiology feels that a patient has severe disease, but my mucosa or the lining shows mild disease, I might be more inclined to use a heavier or top approach. So just know that the, the variation depends on the big picture, and that's a, that's a hard hurdle for the, uh, for the GI doctor to maneuver. So speaking of the radiological findings, um, Dr. Bask, what is the difference between an enterography study versus a regular CT <clears throat> or MRI? And why do we use that for inflammatory bowel disease um, as opposed to other uh, entities. Right. So a conventional CT abdomen pelvis is typically done with IV contrast and often with oral contrast. And that's the basic CT scan that you're going to get for the routine outpatient um, with abdominal pain and other symptoms related to the GI tract. And that's most commonly what's going to happen if someone comes into the emergency room. 
Um, the CT abdomen pelvis conventional protocol is good at detecting bowel, obstru- um, bowel inflammation and is very good at detecting some of the more severe complications like ischemia, obstruction, and, and masses. Um, so if you start with a CT abdomen pelvis with IV contrast, um, you're not in a bad place to start with diagnosis. Um, having said that, if you already know that the diagnosis is IBD or you have a high suspicion of IBD, um, then there's actually more tailored radiologic studies that you can do. Um, and that's going to be the enterography studies, um, either CT enterography or MR enterography. And basically what they are um, is it's a CT scan or an MRI scan where the protocol has been tailored to get the best look possible at the small bowel. And so what that means is the patient drinks a large volume of oral contrast before the study, and that's basically to distend the small bowel as much as possible. So um, it's harder to detect disease in small bowel loops that are collapsed down. Um, So the more distension of the small bowel you can get, the better. And so we do the protocol to maximize the distension and get the best look at the small bowel possible. Um, If it's a CT scan, instead of using positive, you know, bright white oral contrast, we typically use a neutral contrast that has the same density as water. And that basically helps us see the wall better without obscuring findings with the, um, with the brightness of the contrast. Um, as far as the difference between the two, CT enterography and MR enterography, um, they're both very good studies and they both um, have good roles. And in most situations, they can be interchanged with each other. Um, they're both reasonable in a lot of cases. Um, there's some pluses and minuses with CT. Um, CT is a much faster study to obtain. Um, the whole abdomen pelvis is scanned in just a couple of seconds, um, whereas an MRI requires you to be on the table for you know, 45 minutes or so to get all the sequences done. Um, likewise, because the bowel is always moving and peristalsing, um, the CT is going to freeze that in place, whereas the MRI, there's more risk of motion artifact um, and from peristalsis. And so usually with MRI, we have to pre-medicate the patient um, with a medication that's going to slow down the, the peristalsis of bowel. Um, so CT has those benefits, but on the, the benefits for MR enterography, um, there's no ionizing radiation, um, which is important to keep in mind when a lot of these IBD patients are being diagnosed at young ages and they're going to need to get follow-up exams over and over and over again. Um, if you have to keep on radiating with CT, that's not an optimal situation. Um, and then MRI also has really great soft tissue contrast, and the multiple different sequences can really tease out um, subtle changes in disease, and it can help you be more confident in deciding whether something is active or chronic disease. Um, So one common strategy is for the first study, the patient gets to be a CT enterography, um, and that's going to get the anatomy um, really crisp and clear. And then for subsequent studies, if the patient can tolerate it, um, doing MR enterography as kind of a more long-term follow-up solution. Um, as far as MRI done without an enterography protocol, that's typically not, not an option. MRI of the bowel in general, unless you're doing an enterography protocol, um, you're not going to get good pictures of the small bowel. So that's the role of that. What's the risk of having multiple CT scans uh, throughout your life? What are we concerned about? What do you tell your patients uh, if they have a lot of CT scans? What are we worried about? So, you know, the, the important thing is that if a patient needs a CT scan, they should get it. Um, if they have a clinical reason to get it, then they should get this study. Um, it's when we have different options between, like, ionizing radiation and non-ionizing radiation studies, um, that you have some flexibility in different patients, especially younger patients, um, might be a benefit to have a, a not CT scan. Um, basically, CT examinations account for a, a huge proportion of the overall medical radiation that's done across the country. Um, and you know, while any one CT scan um, isn't a dramatic increase in risk of cancer in the long term. Um, as more and more CT scans are accumulated in a person's lifetime, the risk of a secondary, uh, basically a, a cancer of any sort um, being a result of the radiation from the CT does accumulate over time. So it's, it's never an exceedingly high risk, but at the same time, um, I would 
advise patients that have options to get studies that are not CT to consider those um, early on. Dr. Estrada, when you're evaluating a patient for inflammatory bowel disease in the emergency department and they get an enterography or a CT scan, what are you looking for specifically from a surgical standpoint? Well, first of all, I'm looking to see um, if they have any of these end end stage inflammation findings. So if they have an obstruction, if there's a concern of a malignancy, if there's something that needs to be immediately addressed um, with surgery. Many times that's not the case nowadays um, uh, with the access to health care and the uh, effectiveness of some of our medications. We're not, not necessarily seeing patients present with late stage findings of inflammatory bowel disease. However, um, once that's been ruled out, then I'm trying to look to see how bad and where the location of the inflammation is. If the patient is not obstructive but still in significant pain, this is somebody that's likely going to require uh, hospitalization for anti-inflammatory medications. As Dr. Albert had mentioned earlier, many of our patients will receive uh, steroids. The problem with steroids are that, they're very, that they um, have a lot of side effects, but they're very effective. So in the acute setting, they're, they're very effective, and oftentimes patients with acute inflammation, uh, they'll be admitted, made uh, MPL, will give them bowel rest so that the intestines aren't challenged even further, and then start them on an anti-inflammatory regimen. Oftentimes that's done in conjunction with our gastroenterology colleagues. We're fortunate here at Advocate Aurora to have a multidisciplinary team where we can actually uh, work together collaboratively because many times I, as a surgeon, I might be consulted first. All the meanwhile, um, this is a medical disease. And so having that uh, collegiality allows us to kind of address the patient uh, with the best option. And so we will often um, meet, have interdisciplinary rounds, and then provide the best uh, tailored care. Dr. Albert, um, how long do you tell patients to stay on medications if they have IBD? So in my experience, in terms of treating patients with IBD, medication is typically lifelong. Um, Although that might be daunting for some patients to hear, in patients who have mild disease, I will consider taking off the medication if I find that they are in complete remission with the caveat that we do surveillance colonoscopy. And it should be noted that colonoscopy should be performed every one to two years after eight years of having ulcerative colitis or Crohn's disease. It allows us to to look for cancer that's microscopic. It allows us to see if they're responding to medication or if they can stay off medication. Um, I would say it's the exception, not the rule, that patients will go off medication. But typically they are on medication lifelong. Just one thing to mention is that some patients, particularly who've had Crohn's disease, will have surgery, and after surgery, they will not consult with a GI, go off the medication for 10, 20 years, and come back with the same evidence of disease. So the medical therapy discussion is a very specific one to the patient and should be tailored to their needs and their findings. Yeah, so a lot of these patients, uh, from my experience, when they feel better, they stop medications, or when they feel better after surgery, they um, go about their day. From what you're telling me, Dr. Albers, there's an extensive surveillance plan for these patients as this is a lifelong disease. Bailey, care coordination, how does that uh, play a role in surveillance? And how do you manage to keep these patients in our system? I think care coordination is really centered around engaging the patient in their own care. And, you know, when we, when we think about a patient kind of walking away from their care, whether it's, you know, not following up with their gastroenterologist or stopping their medication, we kind of have to get to the root cause of, you know, what is the reason or the reasons that this patient is, is taking a step back? Is it because um, of cost or are they having difficulty navigating their work schedule with their appointments? So is there some way that we can help that patient remove those barriers that they're facing? Um, And can we make their care more convenient, more streamlined for them? So that's really what what we work with patients to keep them engaged in their care. Thank you. Dr. Estrada, um, as a surgeon, you mentioned that surgical therapy should be one of the last things for uh, inflammatory bowel disease patients. When do you, as a surgeon, want to be consulted in the care of an 
IBD patient? So I think it's a great question, and it allows for some cl- for me to put a, a fine point on this. I think as a surgeon, we often try to reserve surgery for when medicine's not not um, effective or it's failing, right? Um, but when does the surgeon get involved? I think that the, the surgeon should be involved actually pretty early um, because this is a chronic disease, because many of the patients feel young, are, are young and feel great. You know, they feel healthy. It helps to hear that while you don't need surgery now, that you may need my help down the road um, and just kind of planting that seed so that the patient understands that there, there's a team of people looking for them, looking out for them, and it also provides some buy-in as well. Many patients get very, very scared to see the surgeon. They, they're in their 20s or 30s. They don't want to have surgery. They feel pretty good. The gastroenterologist did a colonoscopy, and they found this abnormality that they didn't really think much of it. You know, it's like, you know, I, I just thought it was a, a food sensitivity. And so now you're referring them to a surgeon, and that can be very scary and daunting. And But it's important that the surgeons are involved in their care early, but not necessarily to provide surgery, more to provide education and to develop a rapport with the patient. So if and when that patient does progress to surgery, it's not a complete shock to them. So to answer your question, I think they should be involved early, but the role of surgery is usually reserved for much later in the, in the disease process. You mentioned medically, medically refractory uh, diseases as an indication for surgery. Dr. Albert, when is the patient considered medically refractory? So it's a great question and speaks to the exact point that Dr. Estrada just shared, which is there, there's no clear, de- definite time when you pull the trigger on surgery. It is a sort of moving target, if you will. I think involving surgeons early in the process is one of the the best things you can do. And this panel up here demonstrates the importance of having a multidisciplinary team around this one patient. I think that it's a constant back and forth between the GI and the surgeon particularly, that you explore different different, uh, symptoms. So if patients have distension, it's not a food allergy or an intolerance. It could be that they have an intermittent bowel obstruction. So I think what happens is you make that decision When the patient develops symptoms that you've been following for some time but that worsen, you and the surgeon collectively, as the gastroenterologist and the surgeon, decide together when that time will happen. Sometimes the surgeon's gotten to know the patient and says to the GI, you know, you've given everything you could. It's time to now move in the surgical direction. And sometimes as GIs, we need that because we want to keep treating the patient as much as possible. So there is no clear definitive moment other than maybe a patient presenting and having worsening symptoms where the GI and the surgeon come together and decide it's time to move in that direction. Um, And I wanted to take a step back um, a little bit um, and ask your opinion, Dr. Albert, about when should our uh, primaries be referring patients that they're concerned about have inflammatory bowel disease or irritable bowel syndrome? When should they be referring to a gastroenterologist? So uh, just like rectal bleeding isn't always a hemorrhoid, uh, abdominal pain is not always irritable bowel. And so we encourage our colleagues, our clinicians out there seeing patients to please uh, allow us to weigh in if you feel that the symptoms are persistent and have a pattern of intensity to them. Um, One other plug I want to put in, if possible, is that sometimes patients will say, that they had colitis years and years ago, but they haven't been on medication and they're fine. That is a big red flag. Any patient who has mentioned terms like mesalamine or colitis, there's certain buzzwords in our field. They absolutely need to be seen by us because these, the, the, even though patients don't have symptoms, it doesn't mean that they don't have inflammatory bowel disease. Case in point was a university professor who came to see me with no symptoms but had a severe colitis with ulceration and bleeding, but didn't realize. So uh, going back to the initial question, uh, to the clinicians out there, if patient symptoms, not in that last example, but if patient symptoms persist, please feel free to just reach out to us, curbside us, page us, run the case by us, allow us to help you make that call if you don't feel comfortable referring in the beginning. 
I think one thing I would like to add is that the reason why it's so important to plug the patient into the gastroenterologist is that this is an, a, a pro-inflammatory state. And as you know, inflammation will lead to, uh, potentially lead to malignancy. And so many of these patients could have inflammatory bowel disease diagnosed when they're teenagers or preteen. There's a very hard group of patients to get, get uh, to take their medications that we have, we struggle with compliance. And over the years, that chronic inflammation allows for genetic mutations, which in turn can lead to malignancy. And so now we're dealing with somebody that has something, has a condition that is pro-cancerous. And then if neglected, can really stunt that patient's overall health. And that's why it's so important to intervene very early in these patients, because if neglected, it can lead to cancer and it can have catastrophic complications. So, uh, Dr. Albert, um, speaking of uh, chronic inflammation and cancer, um, do inflammatory bowel disease patients have an increased risk of colon cancer? So, inflammatory bowel disease patients are definitely at much higher risk for colorectal cancer. The chronic inflammatory state can trigger, trigger a cell to become dysplastic. And in my understanding, the problem with this is that uh, in, in traditional colon cancer, a polyp grows into an adenoma and then becomes dysplastic, whereas in uh, inflammatory bowel disease, that pathway is much faster and much more aggressive, and the risk of having cancer not from a polyp but just from inflammation in the lining of the colon um, can be devastating to patients. And so, Dr. Pont, what is the uh, role of a pathologist in diagnosing inflammatory bowel disease, and the role of surveillance? So the role of pathologist depends on the clinical circumstances. That is whether we are dealing with the initial diagnostic biopsy or the surveillance biopsy or the IBD resections. If we are dealing with the initial diagnostic biopsies, the aim is to establish the diagnosis of IBD. So we have to look for features of chronicity as well as activity. Chronicity refers to histologic indicators of long-standing mucosal injury. So there are actually four factors we are looking at for chronicity. One is the crypt architectural distortion, basal plasma cytosis, panet cell metaplasia, and pyloric gland metaplasia. I would like to go over some microscopic slides. So the image on the upper right-hand corner shows a normal colon under the microscope that sh uh, which has elongated tubular crypts equidistant from each other and reaching up to the level of muscularis mucosa. And the image on the lower right-hand corner shows features of chronic active colitis. So basically, when we are looking at chronicity, we look for crypt, uh, crypt architectural distortion, as I already said, and it includes crypt branching, crypt dropout, or we, what we call crypt loss, and shortening of the crypts. Ideally, the crypts reach up to the level of muscularis mucosa. In short fall or the shortening, the crypts are not reaching up to that level. So it's a feature of chronicity. The second feature is basal plasma cytosis. So as I said in normal colon, the base of the crypts reach up to the level of muscularis mucosa. But if that space is occupied by lymphoplasmacytic infiltrate, it is a feature of chronicity. The third feature is panet cell metaplasia. The panet cells are normally present in uh, proximal colon up to the level of uh, mid-transverse colon and in the ileum. So if the panet cells are present distal to the mid-transverse colon, it is called, it is a feature of chronicity. And the fourth feature is pyloric gland metaplasia, that is presence of pyloric type gastric glands within the ileum or the colon and this feature of chronicity. Once we have looked at the chronicity, we look for features of activity, which is uh, we look for activity, which is neutrophil-induced um, inflammation or damage to the crypt epithelium as well as the surface epithelium. And there are four features. One is cryptitis, when the neutrophils are present within the crypt epithelium. Then crypt abscess, when the neutrophils are present within the crypt lumen. And the other features of activity includes uh, erosion or ulceration. So once we have features of chronicity as well as activity within a biopsy, a diagnosis of chronic active colitis is rendered, which in appropriate clinical setting favors IBD.
Thank you for that, Dr. Pont. So it looks like that, you know, pathology is very important and complicated in diagnosing inflammatory bowel disease. And Dr. I want to just add another thing. So for initial diagnostic biopsies, the next important question is subclassification into ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease. And this is based on the pattern and distribution of disease rather than on specific histologic features. And here comes the role of adequate tissue sampling. The only exception is granuloma formation, which when present favors Crohn's. All the granulomas are just seen in 30% of Crohn's disease. And we need to um, exclude granulomas of other etiology, including crip rupture granulomas of ulcerative colitis. Great point, Dr. Pant, about um, the, uh, about the um, tissue sampling. Dr. Albert, how is a colonoscopy different in an inflammatory bowel, patient, bowel disease patient compared to a regular screening colonoscopy patient when you're doing surveillance? So in terms of surveillance, what we typically do is take, um, I do about four biopsies every, um, every 10 centimeters or so throughout the entire colon every two years that we do colonoscopy. Um, so it's a very extensive biopsy pattern. There are a lot of biopsies taken for surveillance, but again, that's only after eight years. Typically at the initial diagnosis, we, when we try to figure out the extent of disease, we'll biopsy each segment of the colon. Uh, starting with the cecum, the ascending colon, uh, the transverse colon, descending sigmoid and rectum. But after eight years of disease, then you'll actually wind up just doing it by every 10 centimeters, you'll biopsy, four bi take four biopsies. And the reason for that is to look for cellular atypia, to make sure there's no increased risk of dysplasia in your patients who might not be medicated appropriately. So it's a way of assessing disease, but also assessing their risk for uh, future cancer. Dr. Estrada, what's your indications for surgery? You mentioned medically refractory disease. You mentioned cancer. Are there other um, reasons uh, why you would uh, offer surgery to your inflammatory bowel disease patients? Sure. When we, when we think of um, surgical indications for uh, ulcerative colitis, oftentimes patients might demonstrate findings of of precancerous lesions, such as dysplasia. So patients with, that have high-grade dysplasia within the setting of inflammation, those are patients that we would consider uh, doing surgery for. Um, if they have a no malignancy, they, yeah, that's another uh, group of patients that, uh, that we would require or recommend doing surgery for. The same is true for, for Crohn's disease. Um, we tend to see... Um, but oftentimes when we think of uh, atypia and dysplasia, we think of it in the setting of ulcerative colitis. But if you're having precancerous findings on biopsies of inflammatory bowel disease, those patients are going to um, be more heavily favored for surgery, particularly because some of the immunological medications or the biologic medications, rather, um, they one of the contraindications is a pre-existing state of, of malignancy. So if they have a precancerous condition, that's going to favor against um, um, doing further medical treatment. And you can actually achieve a cure before it actually becomes cancerous. So that's, that would be one indication. Uh, bleeding is another indication. In younger patients, if they have had um, delayed in maturation or um, stunting of their growth, that's another indication for um, doing surgery as well. Um. So these patients have to be on lifelong therapy, Dr. Albert, um, especially biologics. We keep hearing about biologics. Um, a lot of these patients are on them. What kind of side effects can these patients have, and what should our primary care providers be looking out for? In terms of the biologics, such as the Humeras or the Remicades uh, or the Intibios or the Stellaris, um, typically, the GI doctor is due to see these patients once every six months for active disease or once a year for chronic, for chronic but controlled disease. At least that's what the guidelines would suggest. Uh, in terms of side effects, we really don't see much in the way of side effects. To be honest with you, these medications are very well tolerated, especially the, the more mature ones or the more recent ones. Um, typically, lab findings are really what we check for, most notably uh, the electrolytes to make sure they're in check. Um, there is a very, very insignificant but still present risk of a lymphoma that could happen, um, but we do not see that very often, um, so I don't foresee that being an issue. Really, these medications are pretty well tolerated. Sometimes 
local injection site reactions like rashes or redness. Uh, sometimes there's an increased risk for having smaller infections, um, uh, occasionally a pneumonia, but typically a patient is not going to feel the side effects of these medications on a day-to-day -day basis for the most part. And if they are, the GI doctor should be participating in that level of care. Um, and Dr. Bosk, uh, role of uh, surveillance in radiological studies. How can you tell the difference between uh, an inflammatory uh, bowel disease or a burnt-out stricture? Is there a role in that? Yeah, absolutely. So um, again, to do surveillance on these patients, you want to do CT or MR enterography to get the best look at the small bowel. Um, and oftentimes these patients are getting MR enterography if it's a surveillance that they're getting multiple studies over and over again because of, um, because of the potential risk of getting multiple CTs over, um, over your lifetime. Um, MRI is very good at detecting um, signs of active inflammation and also um, finding that there's signs are not there. Um, so without getting into specific details, um, basically increased contrast enhancement, um, edema in walls, um, that sort of thing is going to lead you more in towards, into the acute um, side of diagnosis, um, whereas... Um, Things like thickened fibrotic walls, um, walls that don't peristalse um, as well due to fibrosis, those are findings that are going to lean you more into the, the chronic um, side. And there are different um, quantitative scales for determining kind of the disease activity. Um, there are, you know, there are multiple competing ones, um, but they all have these similar features of things that you are looking for um, to decide if disease is active or um, or chronic or in remission. And uh, what's the role of chromoendoscopy, Dr. Albert, in uh, in inflammatory bowel disease? So just briefly, chromoendoscopy is the special utilization of a dye on the mucosa or lining of the colon during a colonoscopy to look for uh, retention of dye on specific areas that might be dysplastic or malignant. Um, in many of the academic centers, they will do chromoendoscopy on patients with increased risk of colon cancer secondary to inflammatory bowel disease. I would not say for the most part it is in practice. I think it really depends on the patient and whether they need that high specialized uh, uh, care technique. Uh, it is also longer than a colonoscopy. It could take two hours or longer per colonoscopy, which typically goes 30 to 30 to 45 minutes. So it is not very utilized at this time. So um, to kind of put it in summary, uh, regarding our inflammatory bowel disease patients, that are uh, uh, lifelong patients that require a multidisciplinary team, just like our panel here, um, and specifically with care coordination to make sure that we maintain uh, surveillance. Um, I just want to ask one last question. What is um, your one takeaway point to our audience regarding inflammatory bowel disease in your particular specialty? We'll start with uh, Dr. Bas. So I think the takeaway point for um, IBD in radiology is that you know, CT, abdomen pelvis with IV oral contrast is going to get you a lot of the way. Um, if there is active disease, um, there's a very good chance that you'll pick it up on that study alone. And so that's a reasonable place to start, um, especially if you're not sure about the diagnosis. Um, CT and MR enterography um, are you know, widely available techniques. Um, and if there is a higher suspicion for IBD, um, then you should not feel reluctant to um, go ahead and order those. Thank you. Bailey, what is your one takeaway point? My one takeaway point for care coordination and in inflammatory bowel disease is that IBD is a team sport. So it's really about bringing everyone to the table, and that includes the patient. Thank you. Dr. Pont, what is your one takeaway point to our audience about inflammatory bowel disease? So my one takeaway point, as long as pathology is concerned, is knowing the clinical history. That includes frequent conversation with the, the clinician regarding the patient biopsy findings and ultimately a good team work. Great, thank you. Dr. Estrada. The diagnosis of inflammatory bowel disease can be challenging. The treatment can even be more challenging. There's a lot of ambiguities 
and there's things that we don't know. And so if your patient or if you're not sure what the patient's experiencing, reach out to your specialist. Uh, we can help you kind of figure that out. We're here as an asset for you. Not every patient's going to require surgery. Not every patient's going to require uh, medications. But every patient that's having symptoms or that, that is something's not quite right does deserve evaluation. Very nice. Thank you. Dr. Albert. So just one takeaway, which I said before, is that you are, you are the ones who, who um, see these patients routinely. And there are patients that don't know what they don't know. And so we rely on you to highlight these patients and help us get to these patients and, and get them treated if they need to be treated. Um, there are certain things in their history they don't realize that they need to be asking or things that they don't realize are important, like history of colitis or history of mesalamine or history of, of Crohn's or colitis in their family. And so all these things are really important. So taking a good family history is important, but also highlighting the patients that may have had a history similar to what we discussed with you here and then bringing them to our attention so that we could help them. Because the risk of cancer is still higher in this particular subgroup, and we don't want to see any cases that we could prevent. So bringing those to our attention would be helpful to all of us. Thank you so much, Dr. Albert. And I want to sincerely thank the panel um, for their time and expertise. Um, thank you very much. And um, thank you to the audience. We'll um, take any questions that you have. Thanks again.